Thank you so much, Paisley, for um, that introduction. And I'm so thrilled um, to see so many people um, here today, despite the beautiful weather outside, to come together to talk about poetry. And for me, it feels even more special after this last year where we have sort of been together and apart all at once uh, for, for the duration of, of quarantine. Um, and glad to see so many of your names um, once again. And here's, I think, how we're going to plan to, to structure the hour that we have together. We've got um, three fabulous writers who are here to talk to us today about their experience of poetry in the pandemic. And each of them has sort of prepared some thoughts or a meditation for you about what it has been like to engage in that art form over the last year, year and a half that we've been living in this context of the pandemic. Um, and so I think we'll begin by hearing from each of these panelists. And then at that point, we'll sort of transition to having more of a conversation together um, as um, practitioners and people living together in the same time um, through the pandemic. And again, um, just to echo Paisley, if at any point, you know, in, in hearing conversation, in hearing presentation, you have something that you would like to ask or contribute to the conversation that we're having, please do feel totally free to submit in the Q&A area of the webinar um, your thought, your question, your, your kind of topic of conversation. And we'll be monitoring that to draw your thinking into our conversation as well. Um, and so if we could, Willie, do you feel ready to kick us off? I am absolutely ready to kick us off. Okay, I'm gonna step back and give the, the stage to Willie. Hola everyone, my name is Willy Palomo. I work as a director for the Utah Humanities Book Festival that happens every September and October. Um, I'm a poet, um, started off in the worlds of poetry, slam, and hip hop, and have kind of, yes, grown a love of writing in all its different shapes and forms um, since then. I'm gonna start my little bit by just reading like kind of the blurb that we were asked to respond to, which is the pandemic changed everything about how we live, including how poets write, promote, teach and access poetry. This panel will examine how the pandemic has affected our creative and personal lives and strategies to stay inspired, as well as to enable greater student and community access to poetry going forward. Um, so that's kind of the prompt that we were given. Um, putting the lens of the pandemic on that, I translated those questions to myself to how do I write while grieving? Um, what can poetry do for me if I've lost my job? <laughs> How do I communicate the importance of the work and play of poetry to others when the world is on fire? Um, because I think with this panel, a lot of it is talking about poetry in this moment of crisis and great change. Um, one of the first things to kind of answer, how do I write while I'm still grieving? I feel like a lot of us are in a state of collective grief just because, you know, it can be everything from climate change to what's happening politically to the pandemic. Um, to everything in our personal lives. And one thing I was able to take from this book by Adrian Murray Brown on We Will Not Cancel Us. So one really important thing she says there is that a survivor's only job is to survive. Um, what I take from that is just that, like in these moments of crisis, like the, you know, the barometers of how we judge each other and how um, what we call success change. Um, and I think remaining flexible to that is important. To anybody who is grieving a lot, the writing prompt that um, I've learned from my therapist and from another Adrian Marie Brown book, Pleasure Activism, has been um, to write a list of things that soothe you. The first time my therapist gave me that as like an assignment, it was extremely hard to come up with like a list that expanded beyond like two or three things. Um, and it made me realize I had work to do. Um, and I've been taking that as an assignment that I give to, you know, students, especially when they're grieving or especially when they're um, sad. Um, one of the things about, good things about books and poetry is that it's a form of technology that has not become obsolete during the pandemic. Um, if anything, poetry is accessible as long as you have like physical books at hand and internet. Um, there's great resources that creative communication and poetic power, which we were talking about earlier. Um, 
there's virtual poetry readings happening everywhere. And one of the cool things about that, it, no matter long, matter no longer matters that you're not in like new york or la or like a very happening place you should be able to find um free virtual readings where you'll be able to check out your coolest authors and ask um questions no matter where you're at as long as you're like following folks and trying to follow along um another aspect of that um and i guess of just trying to write while grieving um the things that have worked for me has been group writing. So um, I reach out to community I know and some people are legit strangers where it's like I talked to you once 10 years ago um, and just invite them to join me for a writing session. Um, I, they, they are creative so it's a creative writing session and then whoever joins me we as join and I find that um, being in a group helps me get past my own PTSD that I have towards creativity and writing. Um, remaining diligent readers has always been a part of my health when it comes to a writer. And then one thing that I found really touching that I learned from watching the movie Soul um, or Jazz, shoot, I forgot the title of it. I think it's called Jazz um, that came out and it's like a Pixar movie, I'm pretty sure. Um, and one of the things that it says is just because you have a spark, it does not mean that that is your purpose. So if writing and literature are the things that are your spark and your calling, and you don't have access to them right now, that doesn't mean that your life is devoid of purpose. Um, and that is something that I've been leaning on heavily at these times where I don't have the words to kind of keep moving forward. Um, when it comes to thinking about what poetry can do for me if I lost my job and how to communicate just the importance of poetry to folks, um, that's where this book comes in a lot for me. Um, it's not my revolution if I can't dance. A lot of the work for poetry for me comes in being playful and just zoning out and having those moments of peace. And those moments of peace are important no matter what urgencies you have in your life. Um, poetry is always draws um, folks towards the con concrete, um, the senses, and those are important for being present. As humans, we get lost a lot of times in the future and the past and the present. Um, I use poetry as a tool to better access the present. Um, and with that in mind, I wanted to end my little bit um, with this poem from Ada Lamone called The Conditional, which has been one of my favorite poetry, poems during the pandemic. Say tomorrow doesn't come. Say the moon becomes an icy pit. Say the sweet gum tree is petrified. Say the sun's a foul black tire fire. Say the owl's eyes are pinpricks. Say the raccoon's a hot tar stain. Say the shirt's plastic ditch litter. Say the kitchen's a cow's corpse. Say we never get to see it. Bright future stuck like a bum star, never coming close, never dazzling. Say we never meet her, never him. Say we spend our last moments staring at each other, hands knotted together, clutching the dog, watching the sky burn. Say it doesn't matter. Say that would be enough. Say you'd still want this, us alive right here, feeling lucky. Thank you. Wow, thanks so much, Willie. I feel like there's so much that just came out of that um, short talk that you've given us that we're gonna be able to open up in larger conversation. And thanks, Eric Jensen, for asking something in the q and I'm Please keep them coming. I'm gonna hold on to these until everybody has spoken and we can work them in to the conversation that ensues afterwards. So um, we are seeing those on our end. Um, Melissa, would you be ready to talk to us next? Of course. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Marilyn Melissa Salguero, um, or Melissa, if you're cool. Um, I am a Guatemalan slam poet uh, from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I got involved uh, in my sophomore year of college, and I have been um, everywhere since. Um, I've done pretty much everything. I've been featured in Write About Now Poetry, um, Ink Nebula, Rising Phoenix Press, and um, I was recently the nominee for a Pushcart Prize in Poetry. 
um, and I won the Academy of American Poets Student Contest in 2020. So basically what that means is that it makes me sound a lot more intimidating than I am. Um, and I'm really good at yelling about white boys and making God metaphors. Um, but yeah, so I was super excited when I was asked to be a part of this panel, um, just because of the ever shifting nature of the world as we know it now. Um, and so when I was asked, uh, when we got the little concept about what this panel would be about, um, it reminded me of a quote from uh, Killing Poetry. Um, it's, uh, I don't remember the full name, but it's Killing Poetry, um, a novel by Jamon Johnson, um, who is also a slam poet and scholar. Um, and in it, he talks about how um, there was a professor named Professor Harold Bloom, um, who once anxiously called poetry slams the death of art. And so as the, po as the pandemic began to shape our world, um, we seem to be filled with the threat of death and darkness every day. And so as we adapt and we grieve our new normal, um, we explore how human connection has changed. And poetry slams, performance poetry, and just poetry in general is seen as an art form that relies on connection and specifically um, how do we as people touch each other. Um, and so in a time when we are void of connection and how, how do we touch the lives of others? How do we communicate our grief and our survival? So that's what this panel is going to explore. Um, I'm super interested in exploring the idea of how the pandemic has allowed us to connect and access poetry and poets in ways that we weren't able to before, but also discuss the barriers and how moving forward uh, post COVID madness, how we can keep what works and discuss how do we make this a little more accessible. Um, and so, yeah, super excited to be here. Awesome. My I mean, my brain is really spinning already and thinking about the different senses of textuality um, all of us as writers are bringing to this panel and what that means about access. I'm really excited to talk about that with you. Um, but first, I would love to give some time to our third panelist, uh, Joel Long. Um, Joel, are you ready to, to say a little bit about your experience as well? Nope. No. Nope, just not ready. Nope, not a, <laughs> I am. I'm going to start out with the, the panel um, description as well. And, you know, I read this again a couple of days ago, and I, well, I'll tell you what I thought in a bit, but one of the things it talks about is how uh, we stayed inspired in the pandemic as creative writers and poets. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you everything that I know about staying inspired. And it really starts with uh, Auguste Rodin. R Rodin uh, had an overqualified personal secretary, a guy named Rainer Maria Rilke. And, and Rilke it was always bugging him. You know, he'd go in there and ask, start asking him questions about sculpting and, and Rodin was chipping away at stuff or he had some clay in his hands and he was just always working. And finally, he just got exasperated and, and, and told Rilke, look, there is no inspiration. There is only work. And, and I've always believed that. So if I'm going to give inspiration about how we behave in the pandemic, it's going to be the inspiration of how we behave anytime if we want to write poems. And that is to, to get to the work, uh, get that clay in your hands, get that hammer out and the chisel and work away at it. That's the only way to do it. Um, as Ron Carlson says, put your butt in the chair and close the door. And, and I did that and I believe that. I, I think that we drag the muse down in order to uh, uh, get it, the muse to tell us something. And, and that means putting, putting our hands in the language and letting the language sort of lead us towards what is necessary to say at all times. Um, so, I mean, that's not the thing I want to start with. It's not the thing I'm going to end with. It's not been easy. I don't think it's been easy for writers. I, at least for, if I can speak for myself here, it's not been easy. And, and particularly the last few months, uh, I feel a little bit of COVID fatigue. Uh, I've been teaching uh, hybrid classes, both on Zoom and in the classrooms. So I'll have half my students on Zoom and half the students in the classroom, everybody wearing masks, everybody social distance, 
So I've been juggling a whole lot of stuff and that's made it hard. I know that what I began this with though still matters. If I sit down, if I put my hands in the material, I know that language will lead me towards something that is necessary for me to say. And that I think that that's maybe the most important thing. But I also don't want to lie. I want to be honest. This um, pandemic has been devastating. Uh, both Willie and Melissa talked about uh, grief, dealing with the grief of the nation, of the world, and everything that happened with COVID. And that's not the only grief. You know, I've lost personal friends, mentors, a stepdaughter during the midst in the midst of this, and we've had to respond in various ways. My responses have been uh, varied. Uh, I've written plenty of poems. Uh, last year in April, I decided to write 30 poems. I was doing Rodin. I had clay in my hand every single day, and I wrote a poem a day until the end of April. Since then, I've also written uh, personal narrative essays in response to the pandemic, loss, grief, etc. Absolutely necessary. But also, I, I found that the natural world is the solace of the pandemic. During especially the first three months of the pandemic, I, I was living alone. I, my dogs were here. They're great conversationalists if you want to talk about rough and lick, lick, lick and this sort of thing. But, but beyond that, not so much. So I found myself getting in the car and taking my camera out to the Great Salt Lake, to Bear River Refuge, uh, to the Spiral Jetty, and just being in it. Um, that was an insp inspiration for me and it kept me going. Um, and that eventually translated into language, into the language of some of the essays, into the language of some of the poems. Uh, but it was that sort of almost neural connection with the out of doors that kept me afloat during all of the pandemic. The last thing I'll probably talk about here is, is the access, uh, access to poems shelves and shelves of books all through my house. I was so lucky to be able to just reach out and find the poems that I needed during the pandemic, find the poems that I thought my students needed in the pandemic and read it to them in their little Hollywood squares, Zoom squares. And uh, that was significant as well. But also access to, to other writers. I, you know, I run the City Art uh, reading series and uh, we did a series of videos in the spring and poets from all across Utah and some from all across the nation read a poem or two uh, into a YouTube video and we put them up online. And, and that was my connection back to the literary scene here in Utah. Um, and I hope we get that going again, but I also hope we can get back to the library and, and host a reading down there. I can't wait. So put your hands in the clay, get to work, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> wow, Joel, thanks so much for sharing that experience of the last year um, and, and what writing has done in terms of interacting, mediating, um, soothing, maybe. I, I don't know what words you would use to describe it. But um, one of the things that you bring up um, and that others, I think really William and Melissa as well brought up each in their own ways, um, are aspects of process and, and craft and how um, for all of us, those things have felt in some way altered by the, the new world or the new landscape that we've been living in. Um, both like physically and materially, I think we live in a different landscape, right? Because we live in um, isolated spaces before, that we didn't have to kind of stick to before the pandemic. But also we've been talking a little bit about like just the sort of materiality of the language and the reading and, the, um, and how we interact with um, poetry as a space. And so, We've got some questions from folks in the chat and, and just to sort of frame them before we, we bring them in completely. I'm really curious how all of you um, have found the, the pandemic to have altered in some way your process of writing. 
um, because certainly it's been difficult to write during the pandemic, but it's also difficult, at least for me to write when it's like not a pandemic. It, I, I don't know if it, I feel like writing is always hard, but there seem to be some specific kind of challenges or contexts that have been created by the pandemic. And so if you could, each of you maybe talk just a little bit more about your process for creating in the context that we live in. Has anything changed about your creative process, your craft, um, your composition approach because of the shifts that we experienced uh, during the pandemic this last year, year and a half? All right, who wants to go first? That's the real question. <laughs> I can go. Um, I guess one of the things that hasn't shifted much for me is that given, like, depending on what sort of person you are, your practice might have already been isolated. Just coming from the perspective of, like, person of color, queer person who, like, has sometimes struggled to find in-person community when it comes to my art, my community was already on Zoom. Like, we were already meeting on Zoom and stuff like that. So aspects like that had remained the same for me. Um, for me, I'm extroverted, so relying on groups to just like, hey, we're gonna show up and we're gonna do this thing together and then we can also catch up a little bit has been the huge part about how to keep me going. Um, one of the things I appreciate most about having Natasha Saye, um, poet, be my mentor during undergrad was that she really pushed back against this idea that like, oh, writers need to be writing every day. And like, if you're not doing your like 500 words every day, then what are you doing? And she's like, oh, if you, feel like you want to do it, then go ahead. And I think a big part of me has been not fighting for that inspiration, but instead moving yes, where my heart feels inspired to move, understanding that like, yes, if you're a writer, you probably should be reading books and that will keep you inspired as long as you're reading good books, because how do you not respond to like some of the coolest stuff that people are writing, but also acknowledging that like, yeah, sometimes you need to go and run outside. And I don't judge the people who are running outside right now instead of being on this panel, because maybe that's what they need to do to write a good poem. Um, I think oftentimes there's like this one mold and cast that um, gets put out there on how to be a poet. And I think that that's something that everybody needs to kind of to figure out and discover for themselves. And if you find yourself just being locked up during the pandemic, my approach has been not fighting it terribly hard. Sometimes I feel like writing, but I don't know what to write about. And then I translate or I find um, just literature to respond to. Um, and that's been the way I've approached it. I don't feel like the pandemic, other than like the, you know, the very um, warm and joyful, like in-person events that we've had that like can be transformative. I feel like uh, the part that comes from like putting pen to page or like putting fingers on keyboard or however you write has remained mostly the same for me. And so can I just clarify, it's not, when you talk about being in a group space online, do you mean that what you do is you, you open up a Zoom meeting with other interested writers and you maybe chat for a little bit, but it's more about being in the presence of, of that workspace. So you're kind of quiet and you're writing on your own. Yeah, and I know um, PhD candidates too. So sometimes it isn't even just creative people getting together, but PhD mm. people always need to be writing. So I like hit up all the little people that I have in my little universe. Um, and I send them a little text and be like, hey, I'm going to be writing from three today if you want to join me. And then I catch up with some of the people. Um, some of the people you have to be like, okay, we're writing now. Stop. But, um, you know, a, a lot of the people I haven't seen in a while and a lot of us haven't seen anybody in a while. <laughs> so it's nice to be able to like just talk and chat. And then if they mm -hmm. want, I prepare a little prompt if they want it. But most folks come in with their little project if they're already showing up for something like that. And that's just like one of many strategies you could possibly take to like give yourself um, space and time to write. Wow. Okay. So there's something transformational then for you about like being in the presence of other people also working that like puts your nose to the grindstone. That's really interesting. Yeah, um, I think it's just that I'm an extrovert, but who knows? <laughs> I mean, how do your processes during the pandemic compare, Melissa and Joel? I mean, um, I'll be honest, uh, for the first like six months of the pandemic, I wrote one poem and then was like, we're done. Like, I can't, I can't do this right now. And I think that part of it was because it was like, I don't know how to 
vocalize an ongoing grief. Um, because for a lot of us, um, our lives were completely shifted and things, this entire thing is always constantly shifting. And so it also is like, do I feel like I want to speak about this? Because I know for the longest time and still to this day, I'm like, I don't want to write a poem about the pandemic. I don't want to do it. Um, because there's just a lot there and that's all we hear. Um, and so for me, it was allowing myself to be like, I hear about the pandemic all the time, but that doesn't mean that I have to write about this. I can write about what I'm looking forward to. I can write about like anything. I can write about Teen Titans if I want to, and it's going to be baller. Like it's kind of just going back and being like, what comforts me? Um, at least as far as with poetry, because for me, um, the connection that I sought in like group spaces was more of this shared experience and also this connection that we can do of, I want to celebrate your joys. I want to celebrate, you know, what wins that we have, but I also want to grieve with you. I want to be there with you and I want us to hold each other. And so I think that in this little time, it's been interesting to see how that is still the same. Um, because like Willie was saying, the writing aspect is pretty much the same. Like when you get down to it, you get with a room full of people normally either like in the Zoom or in the olden days uh, in person, but there's this silence and expectation of, all right, now we got to work on our poems now, like shh, do the thing. I'm the one they remind to be quiet because I will never be quiet. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so, oh yeah, I'm a chatterbox. Um, and so I think that that's part of it is what, at least in these experiences, like these spaces are our own. Um, and so when I get together with other writers, we kind of mutually agree that like, you know what, if you need to discuss the pandemic in this space, that's fine. But for the most part, we're just going to exist with each other. And I think that like, specifically, like Willie was saying, like a lot of my like people um, aren't in the same state as me anymore, or I am disabled and so I am higher risk. So for COVID, I am a little more locked down and isolated than most people. But that's also an experience that a lot of disabled people have, that a lot of queer people have, that a lot of people of color have. And so the connection is still the same as far as the ways that we access, but like the ways that we access each other are different. Yeah, I think you raise a really important point, Melissa, and something that's very interesting to me, that we tend to have this idea in our brain that like poetry of the pandemic means poetry that's topically engaging with the pandemic, which it might be, you know, um, but I mean, could we not also think about any poem produced within the context of the pandemic as being pandemic poetry? Um, like produced by such an environment or written in such an environment, which as you say, is um, often sort of debilitating energy wise. You know, um, it feels huge to respond to something that's happening around us. Um, a lot of grief, a lot of distance, a lot of disconnection, a lot of um, really difficult experiences that we see friends, neighbors, people at the national level going through. And so, that's, I think that's an interesting like repositioning of thinking about what a poem in the pandemic means. Um, and Joel, I have the, the sense that you, your sense of process from how you described it might actually feel a little bit different than these other panelists. And you described like being in the clay, you know, like that you, this was a really consistent practice for you. Um, and, you know, there are some, some comments in the Q&A area as well that I think you might be a particularly great person to engage during your thoughts on this, like this question from Eric, which asks, how do you stay motivated when there is so much going on? And Eric, like many of us has had a hard time writing during the pandemic because it feels like whoosh, things are pressing in on us. Like how have you handled that in your craft practice over the last year and a half? It, it's been a mixed bag, Eric. I will tell Eric that yeah, there there have been times that have been very difficult to motivate myself as well. 
And, uh, you know, uh, Willie talked about permission, you know, give yourself permission to do some of those things that you need to do. Whatever is going to satisfy you in that moment, I think is really important. As far as writing, you know, for years, I had uh, two people that I sent my writing to all the time. That audience, having that audience and knowing they were sort of expecting to get an envelope in the mail, that was the motivation to get it done. And, you know, for, my, for me, that was during the school year, I'd do five poems a month and put them in an envelope. During the summer, it was four or five poems a week and put them in an envelope. And knowing that Michael and Brenda, two of my dear friends, fabulous readers, fabulous writers, that they were waiting for that to come in the mail, even if they, I didn't care if they read it, I did, they weren't gonna necessarily critique it, but it was like this really interesting obligation and I felt it for years. Mm. Now, when I started doing more prose in the last couple of years, like, prose is so much for me more amorphic and I don't know how long it's gonna take me or how many pages it's gonna be that I've kind of gotten off that contract uh, but try to keep that same mentality of putting the butt in the chair, you know, put it, sitting down for an hour after school and getting a little work done for myself before I go and grade papers. So I, I think that's been really uh, significant. In the pandemic, though, I want to respond to Eric on that and be honest with it. There have been weeks when getting to the page has been really difficult for me. But I will, I do find this. If I say I... I know I need to write, I can feel it. If I sit down, I can write the crappiest poem in the world. And if I've written a poem, I feel better about that day. And being able to sort of lower your standards and just say, you know what I really need is just half a page of writing. Get that writing done, step away. You know, and if you do that, you've got something. Um, I always, I'm fond of the musical Sunday in the Park with George, you know, Stephen Sondheim. And, and old, you know, um, George Surratt sings this song where he says, oh, look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. I love that. I love that. Look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. It doesn't matter what kind of hat it is. It doesn't matter if it's smooshy. It doesn't matter if it's too tall. It's a hat. And you've made the hat and you feel better because you made the hat. So. I feel like you just sort of also addressed Maureen's question in the in the Q&A, which is about feeling like you're a totally crap poet. Um, when you when you do come to the page as, as you guys have been describing. And I feel like that's a great answer to that, Joel. Like, you know, it's a hat. You know, like, even if you don't feel good necessarily about the poem, it sounds to me like you see some value and simply having it created that experience of engaging with language for yourself. Yeah, I think it's also interesting because building off of that, you made something and you can still go back and say, hey, I like this about this or this worked. Because even like for me, the pandemic year was the year that I was the most published which is very weird, um, at least for me, because I was more visible um, years prior. And so for me, it's this idea of not judging the work that you produce, because whatever you produce the first time, it may not be good. Um, you know, it's the first time you bake cookies. Sometimes you're going to mess up. It's not going to be good. But the more that you go back to it and say, okay, this is what I got to do. I like this. You can build off of that. And that's part of it is not judging the work that you produce, allowing yourself to do it, and then going back and reshaping it. Because you can always get clay wet. You can always go back and reshape it and redo it. Melissa, there are no bad cookies. I don't know, I don't know what cookies you've been eating, but I don't think there are. Oatmeal, oatmeal raisin. That is my strong opinion. <laughs> hey, hey, let's stop talking about cookies. Hey, enough. <laughs> Um, you know, Sunny has a question in the chat that's really for Joel, but the more we talk about this, the more I actually feel like this is an interesting and applicable question for all of you. Um, and Sunny is noting that Joel, you're a sort of active photographer of nature um, and asks if that engagement with nature feeds your work. But I also would be curious, especially in a locked down world, right, where 
maybe the spaces where so many of us go to like, you know, actually have a life and experience something that we can write about have not been accessible to us. You know, I, I feel like at least I, as a poet, get a lot of material through engaging in life and the world and relationships and other spaces. And the access to those things has been really different this year for all of us. And so, Joel, if you might address your, your engagement with nature photography, but Melissa, Willie, I'd be so interested to hear as well what places you were able to draw from in a, in a really radically altered world in terms of access. You want me to start there? I'll start. Um, that the natural world uh, puts all my nerves at the edge of my skin. And that's where I want to be when I write. I, I, you know, it, it, it makes me vulnerable. It makes me phenomenally present. It, it touches me with the sublime and sometimes, you know, the dark things as well. Uh, nature has everything from grief to ecstasy uh, in spades and the whole entire spectrum. And so when I'm out photographing, I'm, I'm feeling that spectrum and, and trying to get that in image, first of all, in my camera, but it's, it's happening in my brain too. I, I, I feel completely wired to the world when I'm out there. And that's where I wanna be when I start writing the poem or the essay. Yeah, I wish I could say that like my inspiration for poems was drawn from like nature or from a, like relationships and stuff like that. But frankly, I'm still writing through a lot of my wounds. So like, for me, it's like, oh, these wounds are still here, like still got to figure out that sexuality bit with the religious upbringing, like, <laughs> if I want to like, be truly comfortable in my skin. Um, a lot of my work has to do with intergenerational kind of trauma and gifts that have been given to me as like a Salvadoran whose parents were in a civil war. So like, as far as yeah, there's been a lot of um, connection that has been lost throughout the pandemic, but a lot of it is stuff that I carry. Um, and like, I, if I could put it down, I would, but the pandemic, if anything, placed it on me heavier. Yeah, and I mean, my thing is that like, the pandemic has exacerbated a lot of things and it's brought light and visibility to a lot of things. Um, I mean, it's not just the pandemic that we've dealt with this year, there has been extreme we've seen uh, more of police brutality in a way that we haven't and all of these other things. We have a lot of new legislation for specifically the trans community and everything else. And so it's, if we could put it down, we would. Um, and I think for some of us, like that's some of my inspiration. Um, part of it for me, um, because I've been a little more isolated. And so I haven't, um, usually I get my inspiration from other people or like situations that I see um, because I'm petty. <laughs> um, but um, nature has kind of been one um, in the sense that I'm allowing myself to simply exist in a space that I feel safe in. Um, and so like for me, that's my mother's garden um, because I know it's something that is flourishing. It reminds me of her and I feel safe. And so for me, that's kind of the draw of like nature for most people is this like quiet serenity and safety um, and just basking in the brilliance of something else that's not yourself. Um, but another like the main thing for me has been uh, other forms of media. Um, so just seeing like what my friends are doing, seeing like what Netflix shows are out there and just seeing what are people talking about? What are people finding comfort in right now? What are people consuming? Um, and being like, oh, okay. And either like filling the void that I feel like, nah, like there is not enough poems about potatoes out there. Like we got to do this or something, you know, like just finding what is out there and being like, oh, okay, this comforts me and writing on that or filling the void. Now, Melissa, um, I think in the chat, Susan has asked a pretty relevant question to what you've just been speaking about which is about how you feel like slam poetry particularly has been affected by the lack of, you know, ability for us to gather in a, in a physical space together. 
Mm -hmm. And Willie can speak on this too, because they also arrange poetry slams and things as well. Um, but so as someone who competes a lot in poetry slams, um, I mean, we, the whole point traditionally in poetry slams is you get poets, you go into like a crowded little space um, and you share your work. You are in front of a microphone, like the back room of a coffee shop and you share your work with people and other random people um, judge you and give you scores. And so it's a very close experience. Um, and part of that closeness is what fosters the connection and what separates um, slam poetry or performance poetry from a typical reading because there is that level of interaction and, and especially like audience interaction it's when it thrives on we encourage the audience to tell us what they like tell us what they don't like and just be vocal and talk to us um, and so it's been interesting because it has I think become more accessible um, in the sense that we like for example there are people who are in more rural environments or who don't necessarily feel comfortable because poetry slams are very sensory heavy. Um, they're very loud. They're very like, there's a lot of people. Um, it's allowed people that previously would not have had the opportunity to attend a poetry slam, even if it's just location and time, because like girl had college classes. It was not fun to be at a poetry slam at like 11 o'clock on Tuesday knowing I had an 8 a.m. Yeah, it's true. Knowing I had an 8 a.m. and being like, okay, if I don't win second, like, this will not have been worth it. I am so mad. Like, so it's been interesting to see the ways that that has become more accessible. Um, and even because it's forced a lot of the major organizations, such as like Write About Now or um, Button Poetry, to become more accessible with their content because this is the only way that people are interacting with them now. So they're looking more towards actually making their content accessible in terms of like captions or like live streaming and thinking about accessibility in these spaces. Um, but it's also kind of forced people to kind of like we're there now in a way that we haven't because we're taking advantage of the online media of YouTube and all the things in a way that has made us a little more visible um, because we're putting more resources and energy into that. Um, but the one thing that is kind of interesting is mitigating, again, the connection. Um, because I'm used to when I compete in a poetry slam to hear someone laugh, to hear someone snap, like do something. And even just because of like, respect and people being able to hear me during a poetry slam and things like that you can't react in the same way that you would and so you'll see like little chat notifications like bubble up with like sparkle emojis and stuff but it's it's interesting to see how we're trying to connect and still be like no keep going i love what you say or like you know and so it's a silent appreciation and reverence of the art form and of what people are saying and it's kind of allowed us to, like, I don't know, for me, it's both scary because when I talk about specific poems that have to do with like trauma or difficult subjects, um, when I do these poems, sometimes it's extremely intimidating to be in a room full of like 30 to 50 people being like, and now here's my trauma. Hello. Tell me you like it. Um, but in the same breath, it's also comforting because I am in a space now, like I'm in my room, I can speak about these things and I don't have to worry about performing it per se, you know, I can just speak to this experience and take the time and energy that I need to like do this. But yeah, Willie, you want to add to any of that? The only things I will add is that I think it's a real tragedy that like, um, yes, our slam community in Utah hasn't had the capacity to keep going during the pandemic. And I hope that changes, but I also like respect the fact that as an organizer, it takes a lot of energy. And especially when you're not getting the same sort of reward from it, um, that yeah, 
But that said, um, especially organizing within the high schools, I've been, you know, with all the challenges that educators have been facing, there has been some perks of going virtual. Um, we have St. George being able to compete at a regular monthly high school stands yeah. now. And those poets are so good. We oh, were yeah. able to have Albuquerque come through. I'm able to like send RJ to go coach virtually at St. George and these things that we could have been doing but weren't giving each other the grace to do. Like we've now been put into position to do. And that's something that I'm really grateful for. Yes, because especially for like communities in rural Southern Utah, I've been trying to figure out how to engage those folks down there who, you know, talk about isolated, like before pandemic Cedar City was isolated, please. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my take on the slam bit. I think that the pandemic is teaching SLAM communities a lot about how we can be connecting with some of the most isolated mm. members of the community. And I yeah. love the chat notifications. That's a really, as a host of Poetry Slams on Zoom, I love doing that. Um, giving, inviting folks to respond on chat, giving people things like peanut butter and jelly versus ham sandwiches, put it in the chat, which one would win in a death <laughs> match? Little things like that. There's still ways of engaging an audience if you're yeah. being creative. Um, that's my beat. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how much of this gets carried forward once the world starts opening back up again. And I think we might want to be mindful of that together as a community um, and think about how we can get back some of what we miss um, while also keeping the access open. Um, and we really only have a minute or so left here before um, we need to think about the contest. but. Um, maybe as a last sort of gesture, if we could all just take a moment and answer a question that's been very um, it, interesting to our audience members, and that is, what poetry have you felt drawn to during the pandemic? Um, if you could talk about them, maybe put names or poems in the chat itself for attendees so that they can leave with kind of a, a reading list to engage with after our conversation. I'll start. I, I'll tell you, I read a whole lot of, of prose about uh, uh, social justice last summer, and that was inspiring to me. I did read poems, Jericho Brown, I read Tracy K. Smith, I read, um, I returned in the, in the spring to Galway Canal last year and uh, for various reasons, but I, I, he, he was, is always moving to me. Uh, so those are some of the poets that kept me afloat. And, and then going back to, to John Donn, frankly, and reading John Donne's and his holy sonnets. And that, that also kept me going. I, I will second John Donne. Um, so much love for John Donne. I'm going to, I'm going to re-enter into the chat what I put a little bit of love, um, what I've been um, reading, um, if my computer works. Um, Mac Miller's album Circle has, has, Circles has been like what had got me through a huge chunk of the pandemic. And then there's a bunch of poets there. Um, I've been reading a lot more novels and nonfiction and memoir, and I've realized how much of uh, negligence I had done to myself, um, like in the prior years, focusing so heavily on poetry. I loved it, and it was definitely good and educational for me, but there was so much, there's so much going on in literature that it's like, wow, and plays. Jennifer Nee, Suffrage, there's been so many like good just works out there that I've had to dive into, like running the book festival. It's like, oh, I guess I can't just read poetry now. <laughs> um, so that's the little list there is the stuff that has been really like just feeding me. I love that. Um, for me, um, I just, I have a special place in my heart um, for Hanifa Durabkib. Um, just the way that that human has with language is so comforting and beautiful. Um, another thing um, personally for me has been um, Kay Barrett, um, or Kay Ulandi Barrett um, released a new uh, book of poetry called More Than Organs. And for me, it was comforting because um, it's their experience as a disabled trans individual, but it talks a lot about grief about loss about your body but also like the hope that we still have in connection and in finding the hopeful pieces of us and like just what keeps our heart beating and what is so what keeps our heart beating what we love about that and how stubbornly resilient we are as people um and so i'm gonna put the link in the chat but that's been like my go-to 
Thank you so much, guys. I'm going to pop a couple of options in the chat specifically about books that I feel like engage prior pandemics that um, viewers might be interested in, like Curie by Ellen Bryant Voigt or The Man with Night Sweats by Tom Gunn. And not specifically pandemic related, but a new book that really engages with thinking about history as we live through it, which is The Historians by Van Boland. And so I'll put those names down in the chat as well. Thank you so much, guys. You've all been amazing. I know we have to turn it over to Paisley now for the last little bit.